But now let me introduce them by providing some background information. Professor Anne Case has written extensively on health over the life course. She has been awarded the Kenneth J. Arrow Prize. Arrow also won the Nobel Prize, one of the first Nobel Prize winners. And she won the Kenneth J. Arrow Prize in Health Economics from the International Health Economics Organization for her work on the links between economic status and health status in childhood. And she also won the Cozzarelli Prize from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a very prestigious prize, for her research on midlife morbidity and mortality. Professor Angus Deaton's current research is dedicated to issues of poverty, inequality, health, well-being, economic development, and the scientific status of randomized controlled trials. His work focuses on the determinants of health in rich and poor countries, as well as on the measurement of poverty and inequality in the US, India, and around the world. In 2015, Angus was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for his analysis of consumption, poverty, and welfare. Angus and Anne, thank you so much for speaking to us tonight. Despite the fact that you only recently uh, and just somewhat recovered from COVID, we are all very honored to have you as a speaker, and I hand over the floor to you. Thank you so much, Ernst. Um, it's such a pleasure um, to speak tonight. Um, and let me again say that um, I, I so much wish we were there. We were so looking forward to it. Um, we had plane tickets for Tuesday night, and we would have been here tonight. And we were devastated not just to catch the disease, um, but to uh, miss th this grand event, um, to come to your institute and meet your um, friends and um, at this grand event um, tonight. I wanted just to say a few words. I have never visited the Department of Economics at Zurich, but it's long been my intention um, to do so, if only because um, I've long been impressed by the extraordinary quality um, of the department and that you and your colleagues have been able to build an absolutely world-class um, economics department um, over recent years um, in Zurich. I think that's not only an enormous achievement um, for you, for your colleagues, and for those who support you, um, but I think it's just incredibly important for world economics. I have written and long been worried about the fact, the dominance of American economic departments, and it's just not healthy to have all the research going on in one place and, and not having alternative sources elsewhere. So I think you're doing a great public service, not just for Switzerland, but actually for the world as a whole. So I'm going to bring up my screen and um, Interesting. yeah, sure. I I am also so sorry that we are not there tonight. I um I was so looking forward to spending time with the researchers um, at the Department of Economics, and um, I am uh, still probably the less well of the two of us. So Angus will present, and then the two of us will answer questions, which we are looking forward to getting from all of you. Okay, so um, I could not do better than Ernst did about saying this paper, this presentation today is about the United States, but you will see echoes. Um, it's certainly not parallel anywhere else, but echoes in European countries. So the key point is what we call this widening divide in the US between the one third of the adult population that has a four year college degree, what we'll often refer to as a BA degree. In the US, it takes four years to get a BA and the two thirds of the population who do not. That third two thirds is very important. The group with a four year degree, the BA guys, is prospering in many dimensions, including in money, in health, and longevity, and the other group is really not. And this divide is threatening everything, including political stability and the functioning of democratic capitalism. It's really hard to believe that these current trends can continue. 
We like to just show one slide showing the, the work that we've done and acknowledging our sponsors. Um, perhaps the first one there is a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where we announced what we first found, the beginnings of this. And then in 2020, um, we published a book, Deaths of Despair in the Future of Capitalism, um, which brought together a lot of the conclusions. And we've been sort of updating those ever since. We are funded by the National Institutes of Health in Washington, and particularly the National Institute of Aging um, through the National Bureau of Economic Research in Cambridge. So here is a quick summary of the original paper in 2015. Um, and what we showed was that after a century or so of decline, mortality rates for white non-Hispanics in midlife, which we defined as 45 to 54, had stopped falling and had begun to rise, with the three fastest rising causes of death being from drug overdoses, from alcoholic liver disease, and from suicide. The other age groups were not spared. So if you look at the left picture there, you can see these age-adjusted mortality rates from ages 45 to 54. And the red line on top is for US whites and non-Hispanic whites. Um, and you can see they were declining. And if you go way, way back for you know, 80, 90 years, they have been declining for a long time. And then they stopped declining. And if you look at other countries, there's Canada, the UK, France, Sweden, Italy, um, they, they would have been declining too, and they just went on declining. Um, so did Hispanics in the US, which is the thick blue line there. And so the US whites in midlife were really quite exceptional here as to what was happening. Um, when we discovered this, this is all cause mortality, death from anything. And when you find when we found this, and we're very, very surprised by it, the first thing you look for and say, well, <laughs> what are they dying of? And we look for the things, the death rates that were rising very rapidly. And the three death rates that were rising very rapidly were drug overdoses, alcoholic liver disease, and suicides. And you can see those rising over time from the late 90s through to 2015 in this picture. And you can see these are for different age groups. Um, and so uh, all of these, these deaths are rising, not just for people in midlife, but for all um, groups. So other groups are not being spared. Um, in a... <clears throat> Um, magazine article and thought of the term deaths of despair um, and that seemed like a good um, um, collective term for these sort of there's that deaths they're not the deaths from like a virus like COVID-19 um, but they're deaths in some sense self-inflicted from alcohol from drugs from, um, from suicide and this term, deaths of despair, has entered the language. Of course, once it enters the language, we have no further control over it. Um, and there is a large popular and scientific um, commentary. Um, the key point here, though, is that these deaths of despair, or the increases in deaths of despair, are essentially confined to people who do not have a four-year college degree. So the BA is sort of a certificate of exemption. It, it's your um, ticket to heaven, as it were. It's your ticket that prevents you um, from the risk of suffering from these diseases. Um, we'll develop that throughout this talk um, in various ways. I should note that if you invent a term which gets into language, people will make a mess of it and say horrible things. In particular, from the very beginning, um, the newspapers, the media tended to say that deaths of despair were among men, not women. The media can't really believe that women do these things, but they happen among both men and women. And they tended to think that we're rural Americans, um, not cities, but actually this is happening in cities too. And in some sense, there's a media prejudice against less educated white rural men, which comes through in attaching all bad things to them and not to anyone else. Here's a picture um, of the split by education. Um, so, and it shows men and women. Um, the dotted lines at the bottom are for um, men and women, men in blue, women in red, um, with a BA or more. 
And you can see those deaths are rising, um, but nothing like the way they're rising um, for men and women with less than a BA. So this big upsurge in deaths with despair is largely confined to these people who do not have a four-year college degree. Here's another way of looking at it, which in the language of demographers is called a cohort analysis. And again, these are deaths per 100,000 on the vertical axis and age along the bottom. And each one of these little um, bones in this looks like a spine of a fish or something. Each one of these bones along the bottom, if you look at this one, um, this gray blue one here is people who were born in 1935. We observed them from age 50, um, 55 perhaps through to age 85. And you can see as they age, these um, deaths of despair are not increasing at all. Pretty much the same for the cohort of 1940. The cohort of 1945, which is my cohort, shows a little bit of increase, not so much. But by 1950, you begin to see this rising with age and they're higher. In 1955, you could do this for every year, but the graph would be unreadable. And what's happening is as, the, um, as you look at younger and younger cohorts, these age profiles are getting steeper, meaning as you age, you're much more likely to die of one of these deaths than the generation before you. But also the level is higher, so there's more of it. So those are for people with less than a BA, but if you put and do a graph for people with a BA, it doesn't look anything like that. So this is a phenomenon, again, that's happening for people without the four-year college degree. This is death, but it's not just about death. So this divide shows up across many aspects of life. Um, one of them is increasing pain. Um, their surveys show people reporting more and more pain and, you know, pain is subjective, of course, um, but it's all sorts of pain, like sciatic pain, neck pain, back pain, and so on. And it's been increasing, but again, only those without a BA. People are reporting it's harder to socialize with friends. I mean, that's, you know, one of the things that makes life really worth living. Um, and people are reporting poorer self-reported health and poorer mental health. Um, here's a picture from a paper by um, Danny Blanchfire and Andrew Oswald. They found a survey in which the following question was asked, thinking about your mental health, which includes stress, depression, and problems with emotion. For how many days during the last 30 was your mental health not good? The worst possible answer you could give to that is 30 days. And what you can see here is that if you look at the um, blue line on top, that's this guy, um, you can see that that started about 5% in 1993. Who reported 30 out of 30 days. Yes, 5% who reported 30 out of 30 days. This is whites with no college. That went from 5% up to more than 11% um, by 2019. Um, you see some of it for Blacks without a college degree, and almost none. It's basically flat at 5% for people with a college degree. So it's a direct report of what seems to us extreme mental distress. If you really say your mental health was not good in every day of the last 30, you're reporting a lot of distress. Um, we're seeing a disintegration of family life, declining marriage rates. There was declining marriage rates for educated and less educated people um, early in the in the 90s, but then that stopped for educated people and it's gone on falling for um, less educated people. Um, the declining marriage rates have not been accompanied by falling um, fertility rates. So you get these less educated Americans, whites and blacks, um, who, are mar who are not marrying, they're getting together what um, the sociologists, our friend Sarah McLennan calls serial cohabitation and childbearing, giving rise to fragile families. And then what happens is that the mother decides that this guy is not such a good prospect after all. She moves on to another guy. And so you get these men in their 50s who may not, who may have several sets of kids, but they don't know any of them because they're all living with other men or with their um, their wives. So this is a real disintegration of stable family life in, in favor or replaced by 
um, a serial cohabitation and fragility, which is, you just, I can't imagine anything worse for me than being in part of one of these broken um, families. Church going has declined among those without a BA. Um, more broadly, there's an isolation and detachment of less educated American from all institutions, including religion. Um, Moynihan wrote a famous report on black families in the 1960s in which he referred to a tangle of pathology. And this is exactly what we're seeing um, 50 years later among the non-Hispanic white population. Part of this, and we're going to tell a story about wages here. If you look at median real wages, this is from men age 25 to 54, people who do not have a BA. And you can see that the wages go up and down with the business cycle. Um, but the trend, you know, so even just before the pandemic, when everyone was proclaiming how great it was for median real wages of less educated Americans, um, the um, they even here, this was lower than any point in the 1980s, for example. So there's just a long-term downward trend. And this has been accompanied by withdrawal from the labor force. So what we uh, take the ratio of people in employment to the total population, then you can see that too goes with the business cycle, goes up and down, but there's a long run declining trend, which has gone on since before 1980. So you've got falling wages simultaneously with falling employment suggests a shift in the demand for less educated workers. You know, some people have come along and said, this is just because people are getting really lazy. They've lost the virtue of industriousness. They don't like to go to work. They like sitting at home playing with videos, uh, video games or watching their screens. Well, if that were true um, and there were jobs for these people, then their withdrawal would drive up wages. And that's the opposite of what is happening. So if you believe in supply and demand, this is the story of jobs going away um, and people not being able to find them. And that's why they're sitting at home. Um, we find Durkheim a constant source of inspiration in this work um, and this sort of loss of meaning at work at home in the community is a recipe for suicide that's what Durkheim would have argued the disintegration of society is a recipe for suicide and we think of suicide as only as a, a, well we think of suicide here as sort of applying to poisoning yourself with alcohol or poisoning yourself with drugs so Here's what happened to the working class. Well, labor was weakened by globalization and automation. But, you know, that's true in other countries. You have globalization, you have automation in Switzerland, in Germany, in France, and most of which countries in Europe have not seen deaths of despair decline. So what's different in the U.S.? Well, opioids is a big part of the story. So we've got this opioid epidemic, um, and that was... Um, Oxycontin, which was produced by Purdue Pharmaceutical, um, was licensed in 1996 and clearly um, started this huge epidemic um, of um, opioids, which killed many people. But the despair was there before. Um, you can see the drug, alcohol, and suicide mortality rates rising before Oxycontin came along. But the crisis was clearly made much more worse, much more horrific with its arrival. The opioids landed on grounds that were fertile for abuse. And indeed, the pharma companies targeted places where despair was widespread and rampant. So what else is different? Well, sorry. I mean, what happened in Europe, too, is they didn't let this happen. I mean, in Europe, they use OxyContin. Um, uh, you know, it's available in hospitals. You hip replaced, you might get OxyContin, but they don't prescribe hundreds of them and allow them out into the community in the way that was allowed out in the U.S. What else is different? Well, the American healthcare industry is a big part of our story. It's the most expensive in the world, but on many metrics, Americans have the worst health in the rich world. So we're going to argue that life expectancy fell in the U.S., not in spite of what we have spent on health care, but because of what we spend on health care. And that that huge amounts of money we're spending um, is really crippling the economy and crippling the working class. So here's some data from our world in data. If I can just explain what this graph looks like. 
Um, along the horizontal axis, we have the amount of money per capita that's spent on healthcare. This is in international dollars, so it should be adjusted for price differences across countries. And on the vertical axis is life expectancy at birth. So here's Britain, and you can see each one of these points along here is a year. So if you start in 1970, you're down here with life expectancy at like 72 and spending a little less than $1,000 per head on um, healthcare. Over time, until you get to 2015, um, this, um, the, both the life expectancy goes up, though you can see it's stalling at the end of the period, and the expenditure goes up. And, you know, you might think that's a pretty good thing or not. Um, so if you look at Australia, for instance, um, then you can see Australia looks a lot like the UK, um, a bit higher life expectancy at the end of the period and spends um, about the same in dollar terms. Here's Canada, which is a little more expensive and similar to life expectancy than Australia. There's France, which is pretty much on the pattern here. So you're not seeing huge differences between these countries. Now we're in Zurich. Here's what happened in Switzerland. Um, and you can see them in Switzerland. Switzerland, the curve is to the right. It means you guys are spending more than these other countries. And you have somewhat better life expectancy. So you can see Switzerland is up there. But, you know, you're spending a lot more money and you're not getting that much more life expectancy. So what about the U.S.? Well, in the U.S., in 1970, up until about 1982, it was expensive, but not that different from other countries. If you go up to 1990, you can see that cost is going up much more rapidly than life expectancy is going up. And if you follow that through to 2015, you get this catastrophe. So that you can see at the end, too, life expectancy actually going down, um, which we talked about. And the, the money is just going through the roof. So we're getting a really, really bad deal here. A lot of people are getting rich off this. There's a huge industry which is employing a lot of people, um, but it's just sucking up the lifeblood of the economy in some sense. 18% of US GDP in 2019. Switzerland, next highest at 12.4, but Swiss lives are five years longer than American lives. And the difference is huge. So if the US were to spend the same fraction of GDP as the Swiss, that would save us more than a trillion dollars a year. Now, trillion, just a big number, but that's more than 8,300 people for each US, $8,300 for each US household. And that's just the excess. I mean, that still gives us the Swiss healthcare system. So that's $8,300 is just like free money. Uh, and for the waste, for the stuff we don't need. Just another standard comparison, if you take all U.S. military expenditure, which is not a small amount of money, this is half as much, again, as all military expenditure. So let me say it again. The waste in healthcare in the U.S. would pay for the military and leave half over. So it's just an enormous burden, a tribute, uh, a drag, um, on the U.S. economy. And it comes out of wages, profits, and taxes. So people in America think employer-provided health care, which is the most common form, is a gift. But that gift, of course, has been ducted in part or in whole from what would be a paycheck. If you're an employer, um, you have to cover this health care insurance. And you don't really care whether the employee gets in wages or they get it in health care. And if the health care goes up, it's going to come out of wages. So much of the decline in wages, which we saw earlier, can be matched through increasing premia. Many firms facing their share, 71% of a $21,000 a year premium in 2019 for family policy, decide to outsource low-wage jobs. Outsource jobs are not good jobs. So jobs that used to be within house in firms, you know, like... Um, um, you know, catering jobs or security jobs or cleaners. or cleaners. They used to be employees of Google or employees of General Motors, and now they're not. They're outsourced to some firm. They don't get to be a part of the company, as Nick Bloom eloquently put it, nor did they don't get invited to the Christmas party anymore. 
even though they're doing exactly the same jobs they've always done. So there's like a real loss of community associated with these enormous costs. The thing is that premia do not vary very much by worker earnings. So it's like a fixed per worker tax. You know, health insurance depends on insuring a body and your body is not very different if you're the CEO than if you're the doorman. So financing healthcare in this way takes a wrecking ball to the low skilled labor market in the US. It destroys less skilled jobs, especially the good jobs, widens earning inequality within firms because the low paid are made relatively more expensive. You know, if there's a 40% increase in healthcare costs, which some years, one, one or two years there have been, then, you know, it, it's not a big deal to pay you the 40% of $20,000 to your CEO. But it's if for someone who's being paid $20,000 a year or $16,000 a year, that's just breaks the deal. So um, we've seen, going back to the mortality divides, um, the Whites in midlife without a BA saw rates rise for 20 years. Again, this is all cause mortality, white non Hispanics midlife. Um, and you can see the BA or more going down. I understand. Yeah. So, and also, while this was happening, it was happening entirely under the radar. People didn't talk about this. Um, people acted as if you know, things were going well, especially for this most privileged group, which is whites. And so that the fact that the two thirds of Americans um, who are white who without a college degree, uh, their mortality was rising, wasn't even um, um, getting any mention at all. And in fact, it wasn't collected in the data till after 1992, which is why so many of our graphs um, start there. So it's a very good example of data collection changing um, perspectives on an important public policy issue. Um, the rising tide of deaths of despair, there was also a slowing of the rate of decline of deaths from cardiovascular disease, caused life expectancy birth to fall for three years in a row from 14 to 17. That slowdown is pretty much widespread um, it's um, different rates in different countries, but it's happening um, in a number of countries. So this life expectancy falling for three years in a row had not happened until the influenza epidemic or until now. And I should come back to that in a bit. So you can't measure life expectancy of birth for people with and without a college degree, because when they're born, you may hope they're going to college, but you don't know for sure. Um, so here's the gap at age 25. So if you look here in 1992, the gap was two and a half years, um, 54 years. This is at 25, remember? So you die at 79 or die at 77. Um, and that had expanded to 6.3 years by 2019 on the eve of the pandemic. I'll show you the effects of pandemic in the middle. So the BA is also becoming relatively more important relative to race in adult life expectancy. And now black and white life expectancy are not very different once you look at only people with a BA or only people without a BA, though the blacks are always worse. That used to be very different in the, for blacks, getting a BA didn't really make that much difference. And of course, 25% of Blacks have a BA, 33% of Whites. So the unconditional gap is larger. Um, these um, widening education gradients, you know, between high and low educated um, in mortality are happening in other countries, in other countries too. Um, Johann Machenbach in Holland has done excellent work on this, but we, there are almost no cases where life expectancy is going in opposite directions by low and high education. The only examples where that happened before are horrible ones. They're Hungary, Czechia, Poland, Lithuania, and Slovenia after the collapse of the Soviet Union between 1990 and 2000. And it's not happening there anymore. It's also true that women have done worse than men over the last 30 years. Um, and in fact, in the US, white women without a BA have lower adult life expectancy now than they did in 1992. So 
Let me move out a little bit. Um, Michael Sandel, the political philosopher at Harvard, has argued that a BA has now become a condition for a good job for respect and social esteem. And we suspect that that higher education, that is more general than just in America. The good jobs for less Americans, less educated Americans have become scarcer, which we talked about already. And also their political influence has declined. There's a Pew poll from a few years ago where something like two thirds of people um, without a BA believe that the political system is rigged against them in favor of a cosmopolitan educated elite that is benefiting from globalization and technical change while the rest lose. Of course, that is us. I would, if I were in the room with you, I could point to us all, but these, it, it's us that's the problem here, according to these, the majority of Americans at least. So we've talked about the declining labor market. Um, the key argument is the falling labor market brought social destruction in many forms, job, not jobs or wages alone, but social and community structure and opioids. And, you know, many people have argued that it was just a few bad firms that were killing people for profit, maybe, but um, opioid epidemics don't just happen. And if you look at opioid epidemics in history that occurred in times and places of social disarray, for instance, China before the Opium Wars, U.S. Civil War and the U.S. Vietnam War. So it's not just the supply side, but despair as a precondition. And we think of this despair associated with the failure of modern capitalism to work for less educated Americans as the fundamental cause underlying these things. So let me, there's, we have the word politics in the title, and we should say a little bit about politics. Um, it's very odd when you think about it, because if two thirds of the population are being harmed, and the other one third is doing just great, thank you very much. Politics, democratic politics, you might have thought we'd do something about this, because the majority is sort of in charge. Well, if you look at that in more detail, it's clear that traditionally the white working class would have looked to the Democrats. But since the 1970s, Democrats have become the party of educated elites and of minorities. And again, something similar to this is happening in Europe in various countries. So the educated elites, the white educated elites and the minorities are two groups that many less educated people in America see as opposed to their interests and as untrustworthy. And they hold responsible for much of what has happened to them. Um, that I think is playing into what's happening with vaccinations today. Um, about 21% of Americans have had no vaccine at all and say they have no interest in getting a vaccine. Um, that number is only 12% for those with a BA, it's 26% for those without. So nearly all of the deaths, the 400 and more deaths from COVID that are happening every day in the United States are happening to people who are not vaccinated. And we've got a politics in which the leaders um, on the right are actually encouraging their, uh, their supporters um, not to get vaccinated and, and sort of putting them at risk of death. Let me show you a graph which we like um, quite a lot. Um, and this is the changing nature of politics and life expectancy in, in the US um, over the last 50 years. And what these little plots show you um, along the bottom is the Republican vote share in the presidential election. And the numbers on the vertical axis show life expectancy at age 25. Sorry? In each of the states. In each of the states. Sorry, that's a really important point. Each blob here yeah. is one of the 50 states um, in the US. And if you go 50 years back to Gerald Ford versus Jimmy Carter, um, you can see that this is a positive slope. It's about 0.4 correlation. And what's happening is there is that the healthier states tended to vote Republican. That's what a positive slope tells you. And the less healthy states voted Democratic. Four years later, Reagan versus Carter, still positive. Reagan Mondale, it's getting flatter. And J.H.W. Bush, George Bush the um, first, versus Dukakis, it's pretty flat. 
by the time you get to um, G.W. Bush, W. versus Kerry in 2004, you're beginning to see this negative slope. And by Trump versus Clinton, this is 0.7 negative correlation, um, very strong um, the other way. So that the Democrat, that Democrats used to be the sick party, as it were, and they're now the healthy party. Sort of huge change in American political life. And some of this is to do with the cha well-known changes in the South, that the South was predominantly Democratic um, and has become solidly Republican. And the South has always been unhealthy. But that's not all that's going on. What is also going on is the Northern Plain states like Nebraska or North Dakota are places that are staunchly Republican. They used to be healthy. They're not so healthy anymore. And places like New York and California used to be in the middle of the pack, relatively unhealthy. They now have solidly Democratic administrations and they're moving up towards the top. And there's a pretty strong argument that actually having Republicans run your state um, is really bad for all sorts of public health measures, um, for control of pollution, for lots of things like that, which have a, cigarette taxes, for instance, are much higher in Democratic states than Republican states. So the politics is actually working against the group that you might actually help, think it might be helping. So I'm gonna end with a few words on COVID. Um, so the BA has been protective against both COVID deaths and excess deaths in the same way as it was protective before. That is not true of racial and ethnic inequalities, which turn very hard against um, Native Americans, Hispanics, and Blacks. Um, in 2001, 21, we don't yet have the data. That's one of the great scandals of the U.S. that um, we're almost, we're now in the end of September 2022. And we don't have final data for 2021 yet. And that's because of this federalized system we have and the states don't report it back. But we know quite a bit already about what happened in 2021. The big difference between 2021 and 2020 epidemiologically was in 2021, we had vaccines. In 2020, we had no vaccines. So you've only got um, non-pharmaceutical interventions of various sorts in 2020. In 2021, you begin to have vaccines. So if you compare the U.S. with, say, Britain, for example, both did very badly in 2020 um, in response to the pandemic with many more deaths than many think should have happened. But then if you switch into 2021, the U.S. begins to look much worse than Britain, and that's because they did a much better job of getting vaccines out. And some of that is to do with what we've been talking about here. The, the people who didn't want to get vaccinated um, are, you know, people who don't trust the administration. Um, they live in Republican states. Um, they have less than a VA. And so, you know, once again, this educational divide is striking back and differentially killing people. So here's the graph you saw before, which is life expectancy at 25. And you can see that this huge drop in life expectancy for people without a BA, um, this gap of 6.3 years in 2019 went up to 7.9 years in 2020. Um, there was a question as to whether COVID would cause a spike in deaths of despair. Um, this was partly prompted by, I guess, Trump's Council of Economic Advisors, but promulgated by Trump himself, um, who said that if we had lockdowns in 2020, there would be tens of thousands of people who would kill themselves. <clears throat> and the administration went with that line, which turned out to be wrong. The suicides declined in 2020 over 2019. And they shouldn't have made that mistake because that relationship, which had been there in the past, had long broken down. Drug overdoses increased, but they were increasing rapidly in the months prior to the pandemic. So if you look in January, February, and March 2020, these deaths were already rising very rapidly. 
Um, we think it's probably to do with the spread of fentanyl westwards, but who knows? We don't know. Alcoholic liver disease mortality spiked in 2020. It had been rising up to the years leading up to the pandemic, but this was a clear break. This is likely binge drinking, but we don't know. Um, the people on the right have been arguing that this was um, <laughs> the unemployment benefits and the amount of money that the administration paid out to soften the effects of the pandemic and people drank themselves to death using it. Well, we don't really buy that, but you never know. I wanted to end with this slide here. And this is a different tack altogether. But I think it's very important. I think some of us have come to think that when we think about inequality and gaps between people, wealth is a much better indicator than income in some ways. Some of the very wealthiest people in the United States don't have very much income and they arrange it that way to avoid their taxes, but they get fabulously wealthy at the same time. What this just shows you, this is a graph that came from the Federal Reserve. They took it off their website just the other day. Um, and it splits up um, total wealth. Um, and this includes everything, including pensions, housing, everything you could imagine. Um, and um, what you've got here is the, the dark green up here is people with a BA. Everybody else is below here. And you can see if you go back to 1990, national wealth was about equally split between people with and without a college degree. Um, by today, it's something like 78% um, is held by those with a college degree. So it's sort of like we're hollowing out the middle of American society. And, you know, if you do that, you can't really run countries without a big prosperous middle. That's what Aristotle said thousands of years ago, and it remains true today. So this is a very sad story, and we're sorry that we can't be cheerier. Let me stop there. Angus and Anne, thank you so much for this. Uh, that was very insightful, uh, albeit a little bit gloomy. Is there reason for hope, though, you think, based on the data that you're seeing, even though we're, you know, seeing a 40-year high in inflation in the U.S.? Is, is there reason for optimism? I don't see very much. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I wrote a book called The Great Escape um, about a decade ago which argued that the world was getting steadily better. But I recognized during that that there were episodes. Some of the worst things that have ever happened in the world happened during the 20th century. But, you know, we bounced back from them. And so the hope that I see, if I do see any hope, is that we'll survive this too. But I think the signs are not particularly good. I would agree with that. Any audience questions? In the room, there's a microphone coming. So thank you for a, a very interesting and I think important talk. Um, throughout the talk, you focused on life expectancy and that being the main outcome that you were using to kind of illustrate the point. But I wonder if that's perhaps making people focus too much on the idea that if we were simply to fix you know, keeping people alive longer, that would solve the real problems. And it's not, not, perhaps not that surprising that people who don't have economic security, who, you know, feel threatened in many other ways, are turning to things that are kind of shortening their lives. And, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering to what extent maybe the, the, the fundamental underlying problems of, you know, inequality and people kind of, you know, feeling the need to do these things is, is perhaps a, a, a different focus. That's a, a really good, really good point. Um, we, we focus a bit on mortality rates and life expectancy because they give us um, really hard evidence that things are going the wrong way. Um, we can argue with friends of ours who will say, 
no, 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 real incomes are really much higher because the quality of goods is better and people can afford all these electronics they never could have afforded before. So life is really going fine. Um, and then we could say, yes, but, you know, they're dying in much larger numbers. So in some ways we're using this as kind of the canary in the coal mine. But it's really important to tie it back to what, what we think are the causes. And there's been recent work now, some of it by Amy Finkelstein and company at MIT, um, uh, looking at whether or not, for example, the cost of the healthcare system could be large enough to be having this horrific effect on labor markets in the U.S., finding that yes, indeed, uh, the cost of the healthcare system is taking $1.05 out of the economy is large enough to be having these big effects on low skilled labor markets. So we don't think of it as being the only thing to look at, but it certainly is a canary. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's right. Um, you're, I agree with, I think, your implicit <laughs> concern that why focus just on health where there's much other important things in life as well? And we agree with that. Um, but many people do make this canary argument. It's a good indicator of how well societies are doing. Um, and second, this argument that Anne made is very, very important. I mean, there's a, there's a battle between the right and the left on the data. And on the right, you know, um, ex-Senator Phil Graham has just written a book called The Myth of American Inequality, saying there is no inequality, you're measuring it all wrong. And so, you know, the fact that you say, okay, maybe they're doing better than the, the, the state says, um, you know, maybe the price index is not measured correctly. You can bring all these things together, but it's hard to argue with the deaths. And, you know, if they're dying in droves, there's something seriously wrong. And it's not just old people, a lot of it's him and dying from these causes in particular, yeah. Let's get to another audience question. How does education correlate with despair about a non-serving policy? My BA will not stop the existential threat of climate change. Sorry, you repeat that can, again. Can you say that again? How does education correlate with despair about non-serving policy? My BA will not stop the existential threat of climate change. Climate change. I'm not quite still quite, not quite sure of the um, thrust of the question. Let's let's um, leave this as a comment then. Maybe it is I meant could, as a comment, but it's certainly... One thing. Yeah, it's certainly clear that you're not going to do much about climate change if you leaving two thirds of your population behind. They're so angry. They're so furious with the elites. And I see this in the climate change discussions that you get enormous hostility from climate change activists who are seen as representing the globalized elite. And they say, well, this is just one more thing I'm not gonna listen to at all. And so that's one of the reasons why these populist parties in the US and in Europe are so uninterested in climate change because they see it as one more conspiracy against them. Further questions from the audience, Anst? Uh, the microphone is uh, over there. Oh, yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this very interesting presentation um, and for making time to give the talk despite being sick. Um, obviously miss having you here, but this is technology <laughs> allows us to see you as almost as if you're here. Um, I think the statistics are really impressive and, and certainly very important. I had a bit of a technical question, um, which is about selection. So over this time, you're saying the situation of people without a BA has gotten much worse, but the type of person who doesn't have a BA today may be somewhat different, and certainly there are fewer people in the U.S. without a BA now than 40 years ago. For example, I was wondering about that last figure where you showed that the bigger share of wealth is now among the people with a BA. To what extent can that be explained by the fact that the bigger share of the population now has a BA? That's, that's an excellent question. 
And it is the case that uh, more people are getting a bachelor's degree, a four-year degree than was true 40 years ago. However, it's been going up just very, very slowly over time. And between some of these birth cohorts, between some of them, there was no change in the fraction that had a bachelor's degree. So um, we, we use that as kind of an argument. It's been nosing up slowly, but much, much less slowly than it should have. It turns out that the premium for having a bachelor's degree in the US, like the extra money in your pocket, went from 40% higher than someone with a high school degree back in 1980 to 80% higher um, in the 2000s. That, sh that kind of change in wages should have ha elicited this great response of more people going to college, and it really didn't. Yeah, it's um, important to note that what Anne said is clearly true. If you go back 50 or 60 years, there were huge increases. But over most of the graphs you've seen here from 1990, there wasn't that much change. Besides, if you think about it, it sort of goes in the wrong direction. Um, because, you know, if the universities are full of um, people who couldn't have gone into university before, then you would expect the premiums to go down, the, the wage, premiums, the, the wage to premium down. to go down. You would expect the people with a BA to be doing less well, but in fact, they're doing much better. And then just the final point is, the selection, I think, is important, and you've got to keep it in mind all the time, and it's probably our fault that we didn't mention it. But it's still true that this is the difference between people who have a VA and people who don't have a VA. And that's one of the reasons the selection plays into the story, but it's certainly not the only one. And it's also when we have the, the death records, so we have like 80 million death records um, uh, since they started putting education on the death record, they don't put income or wealth on the death record or occupation or how much your mother loved you. None of that is there. But we do have education, which is why we started looking at it and then found that education cut like a knife when it came to whether or not people were getting married, whether they were having children out of wedlock, whether they um, uh, were reporting themselves in poor mental health and ha having more pain. We, we had no idea when we started that it would be such a sharp knife. We don't necessarily think it is the BA itself, but it's things that come with having had a BA that um, seem to make a difference, including the esteem with which people hold themselves and are held. We've got time for a few more questions, one or two. So you identified uh, the waste and inefficiency in the American health system as one of the key drivers of the problem. Uh, so how should the health system be restructured, be reformed? Uh, and what are the prospects for this and are the the, at least some people in the two parties, in the two big parties, taking note of, of your findings? So it's basically two questions. One is, do they taking note and how to restructure uh, the healthcare system in a way that uh, we can, can get rid of the waste and the inefficiency? Yeah, um, that's a really hard one. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I don't think you fix it without um, fixing the campaign finance system in the US. Um, the, 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 there are five healthcare lobbyists in Washington for every member of Congress. Um, there are three pharma representatives for each member of Congress. They own the Congress. And that's one of the failures of our democracy that has fallen into the hands of profit-making pharmaceutical companies. Um, and yet we pay the highest price for drugs in the world. Um, this is sort of controlled elsewhere. And I think the really difficult thing uh, is, is how you make your political, it's like gun control. I mean, everybody knows this is a crisis and it's a scandal, but there's no way of fixing it unless you take the money out of politics that so much depends on healthcare. It was worse than that. I mean, people, 
we tell the story in the book of one representative who was a congressman or a congresswoman um, who is now a senator who was actually fixing things to make it easier for the opioid companies to addict and kill our own constituents. And, you know, that happens in America all the time. In Europe, mostly you'd go to jail if you did that. Um, and I don't know how you get from where we are now to where we are, where we would like to be. We had sort of hoped that, that there might be one little silver lining to COVID, which is that such a large fraction of people ended up in the hospital and had bills they couldn't pay that we were hoping that people folk who would focus on the costs would move from just being on the left to being in the middle of the distribution of people with income, people in the political space. Um, because what happens in the US is you think, wow, this is really expensive. It's also really complicated. You shrug your shoulders and you go off and think about something else. And that maybe COVID would have given us a chance for reform, but we seem to have missed that chance in the US. Angus and Anna, maybe a, a very quick final question because we're running out of time and, and this has been covered by some of the audience questions here um, that have come in. What are, what are the implications for Europe? Was this very much specific to the US? What are some of the implications in terms of policies so that, you know, a replication of this can be avoided? I think the, you, you have one of the big problems that's already solved, which is you don't have a healthcare system that's out of control than that we do. So you don't have that monster that's sucking a huge tribute out of your economy every year. So that, that problem you don't have. You also have a much more elaborate welfare state than we have here. So when people do fall off the tracks, um, it's easier to be picked up. You have a value added tax, um, which we don't have here. Um, and that finances a lot of that welfare state. Uh, so you have these natural advantages, but as Ernst said at the beginning, um, you know, you've got what happened in Sweden, you've got what happened in Italy, you've got the Brexit years in Britain. They're all being fueled by this divide between people who just feel they're not being heard at all. And this shift of political parties, the, the old left parties have become the parties of the dominant um, intellectuals. There are very few working people in parliament anymore. Um, and that's a continent wide thing. And it's just incredibly dangerous. And I, I, so I think some of what we've talked about goes through to Europe, um, the political side of it. Um, but some of it, you're protected against. I would agree. Um, with that. Angus and Ed, we want to thank you so much. We wish you a speedy recovery and hope to see you in person very soon. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank We're going to go have a nap. Now. Thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, it's time for you to stretch your legs. You can get up, enjoy some drinks and some appetizers.